Which animal is the second largest bird species in the world? Well, we're going to the outback of Australia to find out on today's episode of Kiki's Fun Animal Facts. Now emus, or Dromaeus nova hollandae, are the second tallest flightless bird species in the world. They stand about five feet tall and are only second to the African ostrich. Today we have Echo with us and later Charlie will be making an appearance. Now emus are the sole extant members of the genus Dromaeidae. The King Island emu and the Tasmanian emu actually went extinct in 1788. Now both sexes are actually a brownish gray with a blue gray head and neck. Now emu feathers, uh, just like hair, grow from follicles. Most birds' feathers actually have one shaft per follicle, but emu feathers actually have two shafts for one follicle. Now just like bird feathers, their barbs are very closely knit, but emu feathers' barbs are actually very widely spaced, giving them a hair-like appearance. And when emu feathers start to grow in, they're completely black and they get faded out by the sun, leaving only the, the shaft and the tip black. Now emu feathers are actually less water resistant than most other bird feathers. And their back feathers actually grow in really stiff, so that way they can give them a little shake to scare off predators. Emus in the wild can live between 10 to 20 years old, but in managed care, they can live to be over 30. Now, according to some sources, the oldest living emu was actually 38 years old, and he lived as a pet in Australia. Now, emus are the only birds with calf muscles. Now, they have three toes and fewer bones in their legs than most flying birds. Now, what's really cool about emu legs is that they're so powerful that they can actually leap seven feet in the air and they can even eviscerate predators. Now, emus also have a pouch in their throat that's part of their windpipe. Now, they actually use that pouch to make long, booming, gulling sounds uh, during courtship that can be heard for over a mile and a half away. They even have a hiss that lets other creatures know to stay away. Emus will actually eat fruits, seeds, insects, and small animals. They'll even eat animal droppings and reject grasses and dry leaves. Emus in Australia actually have the same niche as squirrels do here in the United States. Where squirrels will actually leave seeds before they eat them, that sprouts the flowers and the plants and the trees. Emus will actually eat seeds whole and leave them behind whole, and from the dung also sprouts the plants and the flowers and the trees. Because they don't have the crop to break down food, they have a, specially, a specialized esophagus that lets them hold food for 30 minutes before it enters the stomach. Emus can actually go for weeks at a time without eating, so they uh, adapted a specialized way to store fat. Male emus will lose over half their body weight while they're incubating the eggs, so this actually helps them out and lets them survive that entire process. Also, another fun fact is that the Australian coat of arms actually has a kangaroo and an emu on it. That's because both creatures can go forward, but they can't back up. Now that symbolizes forward progress and never looking back. It's also because both are large Australian fauna that uh, are endemic to the continent. Now for the question of the day. Emus will lay 5 to 15 eggs per clutch, but what 
fruit have emu eggs been said to look like? Is it A, avocado, B, coconut, C, cantaloupe, or D, watermelon? It's actually A, avocado. Emu eggs will be laid by the mama emu, who then has nothing to do with them afterwards. Now when emus actually want to lay, lay eggs, uh, the daddy emu will actually go and try to build a nest for the mama emu. And if the mama emu doesn't really like the way he built that nest, she'll actually tear it up or uh, she'll find another mate. Now when the daddy emu builds a nest that she really, really likes, she'll lay eggs in clutches between 5 to 15 and then she has nothing to do with them afterwards because it's the daddy that comes over, he sits on the eggs and he protects them from other males and predators. Now because the daddy will sit on those eggs and he will not leave them, he'll lose 30% of his body weight. Now when the eggs finally do hatch, daddy will actually go and teach the babies how to survive on their own and how to fend for themselves and how to find food. He'll even keep the mother away from her own babies. Now emus can run up to 30 miles an hour and they need to do this so they can outrun their predators. They're also super skilled at swimming and uh, are very, very fast in the water as well. Now emus main predator are the dingoes. Dingoes are dog creatures that live in Australia. Dingoes will actually target nests and will try to distract the father emu so that way the other dingoes can come in and steal the eggs. Dingoes will try to attack the emu's head and neck because that's their most sensitive parts of their body. Uh, but the emu has a great defense for this and that's their really strong legs. The emu will actually kick and jump in order to get the dingo away. He can actually kill a dingo with one swift kick. Their other main predator is known as the wedge-tailed eagle. Now these guys will actually attack from the air. They'll dive bomb onto an emu head and neck uh, in order to break it. Now unfortunately the emus have no protection against this type of attack, so they have to run and frantically hide and find cover. Welcome back to History at a Glance. Brought to you by Listerine. For clean floors and sparkling teeth, getting rid of that pesky gonorrhea. The Great Emu War of 1932. A deadlocked battle between the might of the Australian military against the indigenous feathered forces. In 1932, in the Campion District of Australia, a group of emu actually ran amok and destroyed a bunch of crops that were planted by the farmers. Now because of this, the farmers actually rallied to the government to get rid of the 20,000 plus emus. Because Australia actually suffered uh, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, these farmers needed these crops to survive. The government finally lent a hand and deployed World War I soldiers to come in and destroy the emus. Now the emus were breaking open fences and letting in other animals such as rabbits and foxes. They gave them military grade weapons such as Lewis guns with 10,000 rounds of ammo thinking that that would do the job. Their first assault, uh, they actually didn't know that a mob of emu will actually disperse into smaller mobs of emu when they're panicky. So they couldn't just shoot into a group of emu they had to actually aim at one individual bird, which took a lot. Now, emus are crazy strong. Emus can be like tanks. As a matter of fact, one emu that was hit by a truck and died of those injuries were found to have five bullets in his body. The second assault that happened was when they thought, okay, we'll ambush them when they're around a watering hole. And at the watering hole, they took their aim, but because they didn't do proper maintenance on their weapons, their weapons actually jammed up after 10 to 12 rounds of ammo. And no emus were killed by that watering hole. So finally, someone got this genius idea to mount a Lewis gun on top of a vehicle. Well, World War I vehicles were very slow and clunky, and the terrain on the Outback was very bumpy. 
So you couldn't even aim at anything while you're on top of a moving vehicle with a Lewis gun, and let alone aim at a running bird. So finally, at the end of all of this, 9,000 rounds of ammunition of the 10,000 rounds were used, and they only killed less than 1,000 of the 20,000 plus emus. The army had to retreat. Conservation efforts have actually rallied for the birds and tried to uh, save these guys from this mass destruction. But in the 1930s, it actually became very popular to try to put in some exclusion barrier fencing to try to keep out emus, rabbits, foxes, wombats, wallabies, anything that'll destroy their crops. Uh, so the farmers eventually did end up saving their agricultural area, but all of this has been known as the Great Emu War of 1932. I'm glad that we just got to discover more about emus today. Now, if you learned something or you want to learn more about your favorite animal, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, please share this video so that way your friends can also learn about their favorite animals and check out just how amazing these guys really are. Now, you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram. We even, even have a Patreon for you to follow as well. And we have a Patreon incentive for the first 10 patrons. Joke is actually on the bottom of the description, and that joke is, what do woodland reptiles say when they're frustrated? Oh, for fox snakes. <laughs> so we'll actually be learning about fox snakes next time on Kiki's Fun Animal Facts. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.